Okay, we're leading up to our first exam in Chemistry 241, and we want you to build your skills and get more confident, and so we've given you some practice problems. I'm going to go ahead and work another YouTube video answer key here and help you follow along, give you some tips and tricks, and maybe some uh, ways to clarify things that are causing you confusion before the big exam. And so this might be a little bit of a long one, and we're talking about three pages, so feel free. You don't have to watch the whole thing. Um, come back to it later if you... You know, you get tired, but you know, feel free to zoom ahead to the ones that you missed or the ones that you, you know, just had no clue on, and and maybe you can skip the rest. But anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and dive right in. Uh, you know, this is about as long as an exam will be, maybe a little bit shorter because that you know, there's um, looks like some there wasn't too much room given between some of the problems, so um, our exam might be a little bit longer in terms of giving you more room to work, but roughly the same in uh, you know, three to four pages, so be ready to expect something like that. Okay, dive right in. This first one is really easy. Um, define effective nuclear charge. In fact, that's almost a 111 question. And explain how it's responsible for the decrease in atomic radii for elements as you move from left to right across the uh, row of the periodic table. Again, this is really a 111 question, kind of a review question to get you thinking. So uh, effective nuclear charge is denoted as the effective, right? And it's simply mathematically defined as the nuclear charge, right? And what is the nuclear charge? Well, that's the number of protons, right? That's what determines what element uh, you're dealing with. And so, you know, you count up number of protons, and if you have one, that's hydrogen. If you have two, that's helium. You get the idea. So that's the nuclear charge. To get the effective nuclear charge, you have to subtract what we would call the shielding. And the shielding, remember, the shielding ends up, um, and that's typically due to the core electrons, right? The core electrons. If you've got a nucleus, right, you've got a little nucleus here and it's a lot of positive charge, right? And then you've got out here the valence electrons, right? Valence electrons out here. So we'll say we have a valence electron. And then somewhere in here in the middle you have these core electrons. And the core electrons, right, they're repelling each other. And they're going to repel this valence electron. And so they effectively can shield uh, this electron out here from the full positive charge of the nuclear uh, charge, the nucleus, right? And so this, these internal, these core electrons shield the outer valence electron from feeling the pull of the entire nuclear charge. So what it actually feels is the nuclear charge minus this repulsion, this shielding, and that is called the effective nuclear charge, and that's really important. And so how do you explain now, as you go from left to right on the periodic table, as things get smaller, right? Atomic radii. Right, atomic radii or diameter doesn't really matter. It shrinks as you go from left to right on the periodic table, and you can look up data to support this. It's a true observation. And what happens is, as you go from left to right, what are you adding? You're adding, typically for neutral atoms, one proton and one electron. And you might be tempted to say, well, don't they just balance each other out? Well, you'd be dead wrong. And so what happens here is you add a proton, so the nuclear charge, Z, is increasing, right? So Z increases as you add more protons. However, if our equation for effective nuclear charge is Z minus the shielding, what's happening to the shielding? Where are you adding this electron? you're adding this electron out here with the valence electrons. You're not adding it to the core. So you're not really increasing the shielding. So if Z goes up, shielding really doesn't go up. Effective nu nuclear charge goes way up. And what does that mean? It means the outermost electrons feel a greater pull because they feel greater charge from the nucleus. And that they're going to contract a little bit. And so that means that the atomic radii gets smaller as you go from left to right. Again, really simple, something that you should know from 111. The next one says, how do you explain, and this is really important here, we gotta, you got to use your words, right? Coordinate covalent bond. So what does this mean? This means that we want to know how transition metals form using coordinate covalent bonds. So this means right off the bat, do not talk about crystal field theory because crystal field theory is only electrostatics, right? Crystal field does not tell you n there's no covalent discussion for crystal field theory. So we can't talk about crystal field theory. Instead, we're going to talk about the generalized Lewis acid base theory. 
And this is what we talked about way back in the day. And so if we have a ligand, right? Let's look at a very simple ligand that we all know, the amine ligand. We've got the structure here, and then we've got a nice lone pair, right? And that lone pair can be donated. And so things that donate a lone pair are Lewis bases. Okay, well, what will they be attracted to? They'll be attracted to a metal, typically. And typically that metal will have some positive charge in. It is electron deficient. It is an acceptor, an acceptor of lone pairs. And we call that a Lewis acid. And what happens when a Lewis base donates its lone pair to this electron deficient metal, we form what's called a coordinate covalent bond. And so we can draw that as a line. Again, it is now um, a covalent interaction, right? So let me erase that little straight mark I put there. There you go. And so the idea here is that you've now formed a bond between the ligand, and I'm just gonna go ahead and write a shorthand here, the ligand and the metal, it's a covalent bond. There's a sharing of two electrons, but they came from the lone pair on the ligand. And so that is a new type of covalent bond that we talked about in class. So this is very different than the crystal field theory that we talked about. So you have to keep them separate in your head because they are very different models of bonding. Really important. All right. Uh, the next part of the page here is, is should be no surprise. You know there's going to be naming. I promise you there'll be naming. So if you miss points on naming, shame on you. You shouldn't be bleeding points because you know these are going to come and you know the rules and we've been doing this since the first week. And so if you think about these, okay, first thing I do is always kind of catalog. I've got ethylene diamine, which you should know is a bidentate, and then that's a zero charge. You've got this uh, isothiocyanato ligand, that's going to be a negative one, and the hydroxo ligand. If you don't know the ligand names by now, you've got some major work to do. Um, overall, this thing looks like it's a zero charge, neutral. So if I got a negative, negative, that means I've got to balance that with a positive two from the cobalt, and now I can name it. Um, I can sit here and say, okay, well, I've got ethylene diamine in alphabetical order first. There are two of them. And remember, whenever you have a bidentate ligand, you use the special prefix bis, tris, bis or tris, and then you put the name in parentheticals. So ethylene uh, diamine. And there you go. And what's next? Well, we only have one uh, H comes before I, so we put the hydroxo. And then finally, the isothiocyanato. So we say iso thiocyanato. And then the last thing is the metal. In this case, will be a cobalt. And we already said it is a 2 plus oxidation state. So there you go. Bis ethylene diamine hydroxo isothiocyanato cobalt 2. And you can write it as one word. If you want to break it up, that's fine. But typically, it's, it's pretty much just one word. All right, this next one's kind of tricky because now you have to think about, okay, here is a complex, and in this case, the complex is a negative one, and it's balanced out by the counter ion on that potassium. And so here we've got glycinato, which is a negative one, amine is a zero, and cyan uh, cyanose, we have three of them, so negative one times three, right? So we've got negative three, negative four, so that means the iron has to be a three plus, to balance out all but one of the negative charges so it can still be attracted to the potassium as its counter ion. And so the trick here is that this thing is an anion, right? So we write the, the counter ion just as is. So we just write potassium, right? No different than something like potassium chloride or whatever. And then now we name the complex. And if you put them in order, it's gonna be what? Uh, we've got amine, and please remember there are two M's in amine try to spell things correctly. Um, and then next will be our cyano. Cyano is a monodentite, so we can just put tri cyano. And then glycinato. Now there's only one glycinato. I still put bidentates in parentheticals. And then finally, um, remember this is an anionic complex, so we can't say iron, we have to say ferrate. Ferrate, one, two, three, plus charge. There you go. So this would be potassium, amine, tricyano, glycinato, ferrate 3. All right, moving along. This one we've got chromium, 
and there are two oxalates. And remember that each oxalate is a negative two, so it's a negative four. Water is neutral, and here's a carbonate, right? So that means this whole thing better be a plus two to balance out the two minus on carbonate. Remember, you gotta know your polyatomics that we assign to you, that's really important. So in this case, if you think about it, we've got, uh, we need a net two plus on the complex. So it looks like this chromium is gonna be, uh, let's see, what do we got? Um, negative four, so that's gonna be a six plus, right? I think, um, yeah, six plus, four minus two, yeah, there we go. So now we can write what? We've got uh, di aqua, and we've got two oxalates, and those are bidentates, so we say bis oxalato with its ligand name, and then uh, we say chromium, chromium, and it is a six plus oxidation state. So, um, and then don't forget we need to name the counter ion, so we just say carbonate. And then you put it all together and you get diaqua, bis oxalato, chromium six, carbonate. And I think that looks good. Okay, electron configurations. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this because once again, this is really 111 review. So make sure you're, you're paying attention. But if you use the, the simplest noble gas configuration, uh, shorthand, you get xenon. And I think I get 6s2, 4f, 14 because the F block and then 5 D6 uh, for platinum 2 I'm gonna go ahead and do the neutral one and then get rid of the the two so I will end up doing something like Krypton and then uh, 5s2 uh, 4d8 and then we get rid of the two so boom, that's gone, and now you're left with that. So that's the two plus palladium. So anyway, um, again, consult your 111 book if you're having a hard time, or come talk to us because we just don't have time to review material that you should probably know by this point. And again, come ask questions if you are confused. All right, moving along to the next page. This is really simple. We've talked about isomers forever now in the class, and so uh, here you have to know what the definitions are. What's a constitutional isomer? What's a diastereomer? Really, really important. So here you're given this complex, right? Uh, and it's you got bidentate ethylene diamine, you got a cyano, and you got a. Um, in this case, it's a nitro because it's it's bound through the nitrogen here, and you got three of them. So I'm going to go ahead and assume that it's going to be an octahedral, which is probably a really good assumption. I'm going to draw that out, draw my first complex. I'm going to put one in front of the paper and one behind, and I'm just going to go ahead and draw it as is. So I'm going to put cyano here. I'm going to put um, my ethylene diamine back over here. And remember, ethylene diamine, you got to be able to draw it. It's really important. There you go. And then let's see, that's what ethylene diamine looks like. And then we got three nitros. Make sure you show me what atom is actually bound uh, to the metal. It's really important. In this case, it's the nitrogen. And if you need to draw the line to show me, that's perfectly fine. And then please don't forget that this whole thing. Oh, in this case, it has a zero charge, so we didn't have to, but it's probably important to know the oxidation state, right? So uh, if we have one, two, three, four uh, negative ions, we better make sure that platinum is a four plus. Okay, so now we're talking about a constitutional isomer. That's a structural isomer, different connectivity. So we need to show that we understand that. And so I'm gonna leave everything absolutely the same, but I'm gonna change the connectivity of one thing. So I'm gonna go ahead, I can't change cyano, I can't change ethylene diamine, there's no other way that ethylene diamine bonds. Okay, so we'll throw that in there. And then finally what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna leave a couple of these the same, but NO2 is a ambidentate ligand, which means it can bond through different things. And here's the hint, right? If it's underlined, that's a really good hint. So if it's not bound through the nitrogen, I bet you it can be bonded through the oxygen. And that way it becomes nitrito, and that's really important. Remember this over here on the left side is nitro, over here is nitrito. You could have changed all three, but you know, if it's in my exam, I'm trying to hurry up and only change one little thing that I need to change. And then don't forget to write the oxidation state because it hasn't changed. 
If you come down here, diastereomers, they have the same connectivity but different spatial arrangement. And so we have the same starting compound, right? So I'm going to go ahead and draw this. Draw one behind, one in front. Um, and here I'm going to kind of go with the same thing. I'm going to go ahead and do my starting material here. Draw a complex, right? Easy enough. And there you go. So that's the main way that we drew it before. And last time I just kind of had picked this arrangement. It doesn't matter. As long as one makes sense, you're okay. And remember, these three are all. 90 degrees apart there are three things that are the same all bound through the nitrogen and they're all 90 degrees apart so that means this is what yes this is called the Fock yeah Fock yeah we got it right so that's that's the Fock isomer because it sits on a facial plane of the octahedron and again don't not forget to put the plus four charge on there the um, only other arrangement when you have three of one thing is myrrh and you have to remember that myrrh is the case where what? Myrrh is the case when you have two that are 180 and two that are 90. So we can go ahead and throw this down. We can say, okay, well, let's go ahead and do something like, I don't know, how about, hmm, let's see. I'm going to go ahead and do, um, let's see here. I could do... Let's see, I want to come across this way. So yeah, let's let's go ahead and do this. I'm going to take. Uh, I'm trying. To, the only reason I pause is because I'm trying to think of the best way to draw the ethylene diamine because it takes up so much room. I know it's a pain to draw, but that's okay. Eventually, it'll be easier for you. So there we go. I think that shows ethylene diamine, and then I can go NO2. Now here's the tricky part. You got to show me that you're still bound through. The nitri ah, oh, that looks terrible. Um, let me back up a little bit and fix that too. All right, so if I come over here, pick the right color, I can put my little two right there. So here you're showing me that in all three cases, we are still bound through the nitrogen, right? We made no structural changes. Up above was a structural isomer. These are a constitutional isomer. These down here are geometric. They're diastereomers. They differ in the spatial arrangement, but they have the same connectivity. So here you have one set that is 180, and then two sets that are 90. So you have both. And if that's the case, it is called myrrh. You have myrrh and fock. Fock and myrrh. There you go. Uh, pretty easy to remember because they sound kind of funny. So there you go. Uh, geometric diastereomers, right? Geometric isomers and then constitutional structural isomers up above. Pretty simple. Okay. The next one I think might cause a little bit of uh, worry for some of you because it has to do with a little bit of math, right? And so this one says, okay, you've got this solution. This is a hexaamine cobalt 3. And it says, okay, it produces a spectrum with a, a lambda max. That just means when you take the spectrum, right, you put absorbance up here and you put the wavelength down here and you have this little peak. And then you highlight the one at the top and that's the most, the greatest absorbance happens at that wavelength, right? And then we can, we can measure that. We can find that. We did this in lab, right? And so given that this is blue light, and I would have to tell you that, you don't have to memorize the wavelengths, what is the color of the compound? Well, Remember, if it absorbs blue, it is always the color that ha that you get when you take the Roy Jubiv, right? And you subtract out that color. So here's Roy G Biv, right? And so if I remove blue, right, by absorbing it, so if I absorb blue, right, I'm going to appear. Uh, I'm gonna, the white light's going to bounce off and it's going to tr or transmit through, and it's going to be white minus this end of the spectrum, which makes it richer in the color opposite. So it will appear to our eyes as orange, and that's really important. There you go. If you wanted to get really detailed, you could have said um, the delta O in this case, because it is an octahedral, uh, is large, right? You could say it's large, so it's going to absorb blue and appear orange that's another way you could have answered it okay now here it says want to calculate the value of delta o and you get the value from 
the wavelength. And so we can set E equals, right, as H new frequency, but we don't have the frequency. So we can do H speed of light over lambda. And remember, you gotta watch your units here. So I'm not gonna uh, write all these down, but basically I'm gonna show you. You're gonna take Planck's constant, right? And you're gonna write that down, H, and you can look it up. You can look up C, and then you can put down the wavelength. And in this case, you need to look at the units of the other ones. The speed of light's in meters per second, so you have to convert this to meters or you'll get the wrong thing. So this is gonna be like 10 to the negative seventh meters. And you crank that out and you get something like 4.17 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. And now you're like, joules what? Well, the units are really important. This is joules per photon for every one photon because that wavelength is for the one photon. And then if you wanna get kilojoules per mole, which is what I'm asking you, you're gonna to have to do what? I don't want one photon, I want a whole mole of photons, and I don't want joules, I want kilojoules. So I'm gonna to have to multiply, multiply by Avogadro's number, which is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, right? Photons per mole, and then what? You have to divide by 1,000 to go from joules to kilojoules, and I think I get something on the order of 251 kilojoules per mole. Again, if you need help going through all the detail, this is arithmetic, it shouldn't be that tough, come talk to us. And the answer even gave you a hint, right? It had to be over 200 and 251 sure is. So there you go, that's the final answer. The last one says now use this, use this information. Okay, so we say that the delta O that we calculated was 251 kilojoules per mole and now it gives us the pairing energy. The pairing energy is 196 kilojoules per mole. So now it says, okay, fill the crystal field diagram up and, and make it look you know, like we know what we're talking about here. So we have octahedrals two up, right? The z squared and the x squared minus y squared and three down. And in this case, you know, 250, we, you know, we already said it's kind of a big one. So we're gonna go ahead and I, I left a big gap there, so x, y, x, z, make sure you can do this. And then I'm gonna go ahead and draw my delta O, right? That's really important. It's that gap, really important. And then cobalt, what do we got? So cobalt, right, is is nine, right? It's, it's nine electrons, neutral, minus three. So that's gonna be, so cobalt three, right? Cobalt three plus is nine minus three, so it's six electrons, so um, now we have to make a decision. One, two, three, and we got, where do we go? Do we go up high or do we stay down low? Well, we compare. Which one is the smaller penalty? Is it easier or energetically more favorable to jump or is it energetically more favorable to pair? And so what you end up doing is you have to compare delta O versus pair. And if delta O is bigger, you'd rather pair up. So I'm gonna come back down here and do that. And so now I have all of my six electrons paired up in the lower orbitals. If they're all paired, that means it's diamagnetic. And that answers the last one. So diamagnetic, really important. So there we go, pretty simple. All right, moving along, on one more page. Hopefully this won't be too, too long. This next one's really cool. Um, the idea of mechanism, the step-by-step -step uh, way reactions happen and for transition metals there are two main kinds that we talk about one is called uh, associative which means that the first step or the rate determining step is things coming together or it could be dissociated where the dis dissociative where the first step is things breaking apart right so that's really important and if you look at this complex what is it it's palladium what that's palladium 2 and palladium 2 if you look at the periodic table that's gonna be, if I'm not mistaken, a D8 complex, right? Because we have a choice. Um, so that's gonna be D8, so eight D electrons. And remember, if you have four of something, you have a choice to make. Is it gonna be square planar, or is it gonna be tetrahedral? And we said that in this class, most D8 compounds are gonna prefer a square planar arrangement because of that nice electronic stabilization. I'm gonna draw all of them in the plane of the paper 
make my life a little bit easier. I'm going to label the charge on my metal, and I'm going to label the charge on the entire complex. If you want to draw the whole bracket, whole whole big old bracket, you can. Sometimes I just get lazy and put the little corner bracket. Both are fine, but you've got to tell me what what charges exist if it's not zero. Now, if you look at the, this, this is in the plane of the paper, which means it has essentially parking spaces above and below the plane, right? Because if you think about putting these in the x, y, if we just kind of called, you know, this uh, y and this x, the, mo the, the bonds lie along those Cartesian axes. Well, if we were doing octahedral, we'd have ligands coming along, right, coming in and out of the paper along z. Well, that can happen here. So the first step here is going to be the attack of our Lewis base onto this metal because there's an open parking space, right? We have two parking spaces that you can come into. So we're going to take carbon monoxide, we're going to bond through the carbon, and we're going to say, okay, that lone pair is going to come in front and it's going to hit that guy and it's going to form um, essentially a new complex, right, with that coordinate covalent bond. And immediately, immediately when it forms, what's the geometry? Well, the geometry is going to be a square pyramid immediately when it happens. So I can draw this very simply. I'm going to draw the four in the plane of the paper like I just had. I'm going to go ahead and do my two plus and I'm going to go ahead and form that bond like that. Remember the carbon's what's bound. Carbon is, or sorry, the carbonyl is neutral so it does not change the charge on the complex and it does not change the oxidation state but now we've got a five coordinate. So this is a square pyramid. Now, is this the most stable geometry? No, it's not. And so what we're going to get is called flux. And this is an equilibrium. You get fluxionalization. And what would be the more um, appropriate five coordinate geometry? And um, I don't know why I've been using platinum instead of palladium. I apologize there. There we go. I think it's because, in my experience, um, I used to do some pl platinum chemistry. And so I always like to go there. But it doesn't matter. Palladium is what I should have wrote. One two, three, and this is how I draw um, trigonal by pyramid. So I'm going to put a chloro here, chloro there, chloro there, I'll put the one carbonyl there, boom. Still draw the plus charge and the minus overall. And here we have the trigonal by pyramid. Really important. And I would argue that if you look at the bond angles here, over here in square planar, they're all 90, and you can prove that to yourself, or at least they're really close to 90. Over here, you've got a couple of 90, but more importantly, you got these ones that opened up in the equatorial range, right, that are 120, which really opens up that steric stabilization, spreads things out, and reduces the repulsion. And so now what we do is we say, okay, now we got five things. Let's look at the product. What is our final product? We must lose what? We must lose one of our chloros in order to become Cl3. And if we look at that, well, the next step, it doesn't really matter which one, but my guess is this one's going to be more stable. So I'll take this one and I will allow, you know, one of those chloros to leave. So I'm going to put minus chloro. And what am I going to get? Well, I'm going to get my square planar back. And I actually wrote palladium right this time. Still two plus. We didn't do any redox chemistry. I'm going to put my carbonyl there, bound to the carbon. Chloro, chloro, chloro. And again, now we have to look at the charge. Two plus palladium, one, two, three negatives. So that means only a one minus left. And there you go. That's a mechanism, a step by step way to look at this. And what was the first step, the most important step? It was this association, right? So it was an association. So that's the kind of mechanism. It's an associative mechanism. And then it says, um, you know, if you wanted to, right, we could think about the next part, which is the rate. And so how do you write the rate law? Well, what's the rate determining step? That's the one that determines the rate. You can never be faster than your rate determining step. This would be our slow step for the reaction. So anything involved in the slow step needs to be in the rate law. Um, so now we can write rate equals K for the little rate constant times the concentration of uh, the metal complex, right? And I'll put brackets around that whole thing so you know I'm talking about the concentration of that. And there's one metal complex involved, so we just say it's first order, 
And then finally, the concentration of the ligand matters because the incoming ligand is really important. There's only one of those. So the rate law is K times metal concentration times ligand concentration. That's really important. And so if it's first order on both of these, we have to remember from the integrated rate law, right? We see here that both of these exponents are one. So if we were to pick any one of these, we could plot what? We could plot uh, the natural log of whatever reactant in this case we're worrying about the metal so we can put that in there times or that would be on the y-axis right y-axis um, and I'll just put there in the palladium right you can write the whole thing if you want to versus on the x-axis what do we need we need time and that could be in units of seconds or whatever so there you go that's really important you'll talk about that in class uh, very soon if you haven't by the time this is posted on online Finally, we get to an equilibrium problem, and I really love equilibrium problems because they show that you really understand what's going on both in terms of the chemistry and of the arithmetic. A little bit of algebra if you have to. So it says calculate the concentration of lead. Uh, lead's terrible. We don't want lead, so we'd like to get rid of it. But if you look at this lead chloride, right, we want to find the KSP, and luckily for us, we've got a small KSP, but I would argue it's not that small. It's 10 negative fifth. So we can go ahead and write the reaction that we need so we can say PBCL2 and that's a solid right solid and that's going to be in equilibrium with its solubility products right so PB2 plus that's going to be aqueous or aqueous and then really important here lead 2 chloride so we've got um, we've got two chlorides and those are going to be aqueous or aqueous as well now we can use that was our reaction so now we can do our initial conditions the solid we don't need to worry about because it's not part of the equilibrium expression and if you want to write it you can say okay K SP is what it's equal to the concentration of lead 2 times at equilibrium which is important times the concentration of chloride at equilibrium squared so that's really important remember the solid is not included in the equilibrium expression so you don't want to consider that it's not in the ice table lead did we put any lead in to begin with no we had zero and then do we put any chloride in no we're talking about di water initially there was nothing so now what's the change well we don't care about the solid well if there's nothing over here we need to reach k we have to go up so we're going to go plus x and then over here look at the stoichiometry plus 2x because every one of these that breaks up gives you one lead and two chlorides really important important there so then equilibrium we just add them x and 2x and now we can write it all out we can say okay I'm gonna go ahead and write it all in a you know pretty much all detailed I like to write my equilibrium constant expression because it reminds me of what I'm dealing with which is always good don't forget the exponent right that 2 is really important and now we can say okay it's gonna be s times 2s squared and remember that 2 goes into here and into here so that equals s times I'll break it up one more time s squared which if you do it one more time is 4s cubed and that equals the number 1.2 times 10 to the negative fifth at this point you can solve um, and, and you might ask well, Dr. Porter why did you go to s well sometimes I cheat and I call these s's and you don't have to do this I think Dr. Cook calls them X's and that's fine I call them S's because that ends up being the molar solubility remember that from some of the homework uh, if you don't want to call it S you can call it X I'm sorry I shouldn't have done something different than Dr. Cook but it's not a big deal basically we're gonna solve for S or X and I think I get something like um, 0 0.014 molar and that S is equal to lead equals the concentration of lead 2 plus at equilibrium if I want the concentration of the chloride I multiply this by 2 so there you go finally the last one says okay this is ridiculous we don't want this much lead in our solution so how can we reduce this right and this is basically going back up and looking at the equation and thinking about what would Le Chatelier like you know what would he do well if we want to drive this we'd like to push it this direction right we would like to get more of this in solid form we don't want to have this lead in solution that's bad for us right it's poisonous so we don't want to have that in the water so if we want to get rid of lead we can do what we can um, 
we want to add something, so what would we do? Well, if we add some chloride, what would happen? It's going to shift the reaction. So can we name a salt that has chloride? Well, sure you can. Sodium chloride, um, potassium chloride, calcium chloride. You can name all kinds of chlorides. Whatever your favorite chloride is, you can add it. Now, you know, what is the explanation here? Well, the explanation is, it's what? It's the common ion effect. And to be honest, that's not an explanation. That's a term. What does that mean? It just means we use Le Chatelier to add an ion that's common to the reaction to drive it in the direction we want. So if we add chloride, it will drive it towards solid, which would change and reduce the concentration of lead at equilibrium, which is great. Now, please don't, <laughs> I mean, you could have said, let's add more lead, and that'll push it. Well, sure, but if you're, if you're adding more lead, that kind of defeats the purpose of decreasing the concentration of lead. So let, let's not add lead. I mean, technically, if you have the common ion, you know, it, it does shift it over a little bit, but you're just dumping lead into something you want to reduce the lead in. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So if I were you, I would just pick the chloride and be done with it. Anyway, so in a nutshell, that's that's what you need to know. Uh, these are good representative problems of the kind that you will have on an exam. And um, you know, I tried to get this done as quickly as possible, but I know it's, it's a little bit past 30 minutes. But I hope this is helpful. If you have questions, come talk to us. But I hope this ends up clarifying a little bit of confusion and, and, and help you check your work after working hard on this. I know a lot of you are building momentum and feeling more confident, and that's the direction you need to go. At the same time, you really need to divorce yourself from your notes. You need to not be looking at the, you know, the answer keys while you're doing these. The best thing to do is put yourself in a room and, and give yourself a time. Say, I've got 10 minutes to work this problem. I'm not going to look at any notes. I'm not going to be distracted by social media. I'm just going to focus. And when you get to that point, when you can solve these problems with confidence in a reasonable amount of time, uh, that's when you'll know uh, you're ready. And we want you to all do well. Uh, we'll have another review session, but at the same time, keep working hard, and uh, we'll see you in class.